All right, you know the drill by now. Jesus tells his apostles, you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and all Judea and Samaria. Acts chapters 8 to 12. And these chapters are really going to tell the story of how the church went from being a small Jerusalem-based community to being a multi-ethnic international movement. And we see that the gospel, the word, is going to be crossing barriers again and again and again. And these barriers are, are hurdles. And this is our hurdler. My wife was a hurdler when she was uh, in college or maybe it was or in uh, high school. Maybe it was middle school. I can't remember. But she knows a little bit about hurdling, certainly more than I do. But the gospel is going to go over hurdle after hurdle. And the first one, it's pretty low. The first barrier the gospel crosses is in chapter 2, and that's when the gospel goes to the Jews. That's a pretty low hurdle. <clears throat> and the next one is Hellenistic Jews, and the Hellenistic Jews are Greek-speaking Jews. This happens in, in chapter 6, 6a there. Um, <clears throat> the gospel is going over ooh, another hurdle. And then it's going to go towards Samaritans. We see Philip is going to take the gospel to the Samaritans in um, chapter 8, the second half of chapter, um, no, actually the first half, my bad. Erase, erase, erase. First half of chapter 8. And then um, <coughs> the Ethiopian eunuch, um, a, a eunuch, a Gentile eunuch is going to be brought into the church in 8b. And um, what's interesting and unique about this is that here we have a Gentile who is not um, capable of being circumcised, right? So it's a special class of Gentile, um, you know, one step farther out from perhaps uh, what is the center here, uh, the Jerusalemite Jew. And then um, in chapter 10, this is an important moment, Cornelius, a God-fearing Gentile, is welcomed into the church. Peter is the one who takes the gospel and <laughs> goes over that hurdle. Um, <laughs> and then in chapter 13, now we are moving ahead here. In chapter 13, um, Paul is going to take the gospel to pagan Gentiles, Gentiles who don't know or care about um, the Jewish God. And they're going to come to um, believe in, in the Messiah. And then there's this interesting, um, another class of Jew uh, becomes a follower of Jesus in chapter 19, and that is in um, the first half of chapter 19. And these are disciples of John the Baptist. Paul, while he's in Ephesus in chapter 19, discovers that there are some disciples of John the Baptist who didn't know um, about about Jesus and the coming of the Spirit. And in, in many of these um, instances, we see that God's uh, seal of approval is placed upon the conversion and the welcoming in of this new uh, individual, this new group into the church by pouring out his spirit and uh, by giving the, the, the gift of, of tongues in the moment of, of, the moment of conversion. Um, but uh, the entrance of Gentiles into the church is going to raise a whole lot of questions. So these classes here are our Gentiles, um, and they're going to raise a whole lot of questions for the church. Um, let's see. Gentiles. Um, this is a table, and uh, around this round table, the apostles are going to meet. They're going to meet twice. Um, in Jerusalem, they're going to have a couple of Jerusalem councils. One of those councils is going to take place in chapter 11, after the conversion of Cornelius. And another one in chapter 15, I know we're jumping ahead a little bit here, but I think now is the right time to discuss these councils, which take place after Paul's first missionary journey. And there's a lot of questions that are raised by Gentiles coming into the church. I mean, after all, um, we worship a Jewish God, right? The God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And Jesus is a Jewish Messiah. And one day he's going to come back again and rule the world from Jerusalem. Um, so 
how do Gentiles fit into this picture? Do they have to become Jews first in order to enter into um, a relationship with the Jewish God and the Jewish Messiah? I mean, that's how it's always been in the past, right? Um, Gentiles who you know, became God-fearers, next would become proselytes, and they would be circumcised, and they would keep the law of Moses. Um, but um, <clears throat> some of these guys may be asking the question, well, how do we then minister to and evangelize Gentiles if we're always worried about breaking the law when we're in their presence? That's, that's certainly a dividing wall of hostility right there. Um, and what about Christian Jews? I mean, do Christian Jews have to uh, <clears throat> keep the law of um, Moses as well? I mean, didn't Jesus say that this cup is the cup of the new covenant in my blood? Doesn't the new covenant replace the old covenant? Um, so there's lots of questions, and these questions didn't get answered overnight. I mean, think about how many of Paul's letters um, speak about this Jew-Gentile issue. I mean, Galatians, uh, <clears throat> Romans, it's in 2 Corinthians. I mean, um, certainly the, the book of Hebrews as well, uh, uh, Philippians 3, Ephesians 2, it's all over the place. Um, and it's in these two councils in chapter 11 and chapter 15. Before we take a look at these, though, I do want to mention one thing that I forgot, and it's important enough to interrupt my flow of thought um, so all of these uh, different classes of Jews that are being welcomed into the church, they kind of prefigure and anticipate the day when God will reunite all of the tribes of Israel um, back within um, <coughs> geographic uh, Israel, which I believe is going to happen in the future. Um, and this just represents the reuniting of the staff of Ezekiel in Ezekiel 37. But anyways, back to... Um, this question about the Gentiles and the Jerusalem Council, first in chapter 11. Let's take a look. Okay, here we are, chapter 11. What is the problem that's going to be addressed in this council here? Um, <clears throat> the Gentiles had received the word of God. We see Cornelius and his family is saved. So Peter goes up to Jerusalem and have a little chat about it, a chat with the circumcision party who's going to criticize Peter, saying, you went to uncircumcised men and you ate with them? You're breaking the Torah, man. What are you doing? And Peter, he's like, I know. Uh, that's what I said. I'm with you, buddy. I, I'm thinking the same way that you do. Let's go back to, to chapter 10 and verse 28, where Peter says to Cornelius, you know how unlawful it is for a Jew to associate or visit with anyone of another nation. Um, I didn't want to do this, but Jesus made me do this. We see this even more explicitly in verse 14 after this vision that he has, rise, Peter, kill and eat um, unclean animals. And Peter says, no, no, Lord, I've never eaten anything that is common or unclean. Don't make me do it. And Jesus has to slap him upside the head and he gives him this um, vision, which is repeated three times. A sheet descends from heaven Unclean animals are in it. Rise, Peter, kill and eat. Um, and the interpretation of this vision is given to us twice. What God has made clean, do not call common. And again, God has showed me that I should not call any person common or unclean. So the, the results, the conclusion of this first council, it's kind of a surprising one. Um, the blessings of the new covenant, the, the spirit being poured out, you think um, <coughs> of Joel 2 and um, Isaiah, I think it's 35, and certainly Ezekiel 36. <coughs> These promises, the new covenant promise of the spirit was made to the nation of Israel, but the Gentiles are included in that promise as well. Promised to Israel, but given also to the Gentiles. That's the first council. Second council, this one's gonna, where it's going to get tough, chapter 15. Let's take a look. Okay, 15. Ba, 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 ba. Now, some men came down to Judea. They were teaching um, the brothers, unless you are circumcised, according to the law of Moses, you cannot be saved. That's a big statement. 
um, it is necessary to circumcise these Gentiles and order them to keep the law of Moses. And they all got together and um, talked about this, debated this. Um, and <clears throat> honestly, um, these guys in the circumcision party had a pretty good argument. Um, I'm sure that they were reading Genesis 17 when they were making their opening statements there at the council, where um, <clears throat> God says, I'm going to make a covenant with you, Abraham, um, here in verse 2. And let me tell you what my covenant is. Verse 10, this is my covenant. Every male among you must be circumcised. Now, who's included within this group? Who are the, the males who are among you? Verse 7, it says, I establish my covenant between me and your offspring. Well, who are your offspring? It says in verse 4, my covenant is with you, for you shall be a father of multiple nations. So that sounds like Gentiles, right? I mean, don't you know the song? Um, father Abraham had many sons. Many sons had Father Abraham. I am one of them. I'm a Gentile, by the way, and so are you. Let's all praise the Lord, right hand, left hand, right? I mean, this is what they're saying, and it's an eternal covenant. Look at verse 13. So my covenant will be in your flesh, and it will be an everlasting covenant. How many times is this word everlasting used? Three times um, here in this section. But the conclusion of this council is that no, Gentiles do not have to be circumcised in order to be saved. Um, and there's a series of... Uh, arguments that are made. Um, <clears throat> so Peter and Paul, these guys, they're going to make appeals to experience. Peter's going to say that God poured out the Spirit on Cornelius and his household while they were uncircumcised. God accepted them. And Paul's going to say, yes, he worked miracles um, in Acts 13 and 14 among uncircumcised Gentiles, proving, therefore, that God accepted them as they were. And then Peter's going to make a theological argument. He's going to say that the law is like a yoke that is on our neck, which neither we nor our fathers have been able to keep. And certainly the Gentiles can't either, for both we and they are saved in the same way, that is, by grace, through faith, apart from the law. And then James, who evidently is the leader of this whole Jerusalem church, um, he's going to stand up and say that what happened um, in chapter 10 with Cornelius and his household uh, <clears throat> receiving the Spirit is that God was fulfilling Amos chapter 9, which says that he was taking from the Gentiles a people for his name and not making them Jewish first by circumcising them and having them um, obey the law of, of Moses. Now, I want to take a look at <clears throat> verse 28 because it's, a, it's going to introduce another very important theme in this book. Um, so, verse 28 of Acts 15. Acts 15. Scroll down to 28. So, the council is going to write a letter and send it off to the um, Gentile church. Gentile churches, first in Antioch, and then Paul is going to take it on a second missionary journey. And they're going to say, For it seemed good to the Holy Spirit and to us, not to lay on any greater burden um, than these. And what this is saying, what this is saying is that the Holy Spirit was the one who guided this conversation um, to the conclusion that Gentiles are saved as Gentiles. Um, so this book, returning to the title, Acts of Jesus, we can extend that title and say this is the Acts of Jesus and the Spirit I mean, it is the Spirit of Jesus, after all, and that the Spirit is going to reach down. Um, Jesus, through the Spirit, is going to reach down and guide the church. This is the hand of God reaching down. Here's his thumb um, and four fingers, one, two, three, four. Reach down and guide and direct the church. I mean, at every important and significant turning point, milestone, we see the direct intervention of God guiding and directing the church where he wants it to go. And that is certainly the case here in, in um, Acts 15, but I want to look at a couple of other examples of God's guiding hand within these chapters too. So <clears throat> think about um, Philip being guided to the Ethiopian eunuch 
uh, the spirit told Philip, go to the random place in the wilderness. And when you get there, there's a chariot. And the spirit says, go inside that chariot. So he does, and uh, the Ethiopian eunuch is saved. Um, I mean, how many miraculous things happened in this account in chapter 10? Cornelius uh, gets a visit from an angel. Paul sees a vision. The spirit tells, um, excuse me, Peter, tells Peter to <coughs> go immediately with Cornelius' servants. And then um, uh, Jesus pours the spirit out on them as well. Um, you think about the conversion of Paul. Paul gets a vision. Ananias gets a vision. I mean, everything just comes together. God's like, this is this is the moment. My hand is going to be on the church, and it's going to be it's going to be active. Um, and there's one final episode I want to look at, which <laughs> demonstrates how God's guiding hand is active in this early church, and that's in chapter um, 13. Take a look. Now. You astute students would remember that Acts 13 is in our third section, not Jerusalem, not Judea and Samaria, but to the ends of the earth. And the church at Antioch, well, they're worshiping and fasting, and the Holy Spirit said, the Holy Spirit said to those that church at Antioch, set apart for me Barnabas and Saul for the work to which I have called them. And after praying and fasting, they sent them off on the first missionary journey. And we are going to take a look at the first, second, and third missionary journeys of Paul in Acts 13 to 20 next.